We now move to urgency motions. I'm going to deal with the uh, urgency motion put forward by Senator Pocock. So Senator Pocock has submitted a proposal under Standing Order 75. It's shown on item 14 of today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Thank you. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly and I call Senator Pocock. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Thank you. Australians elected the 47th Parliament with a mandate for real and ambitious climate action. The government may have uh, their mandate of 43 per cent, but there are many MPs and senators with their mandate for, mandate for action more in line with the science. Scientists have spent decades telling us that we need to act now to hold global warming to 1.5 degrees if we are to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. Effects that we're already seeing, communities across the country are experiencing the costs are mounting up. We're seeing uh, natural disaster after natural disaster. And we're not seeing the kind of action from politicians that we need. The safeguard mechanism presents an opportunity for us to show the children who come through here and, and, and watch uh, Senate proceedings, children across the country who have uh, asked the government who have taken the government to court to say you have a duty of care to look after us and we've seen the Australian government challenge that and say we don't have a duty of care to young people and future generations. We have an opportunity with the safeguard mechanism to begin to bring our climate action in line with the science. The safeguard mechanism has to work it has to actually reduce emissions. And this means ensuring that emissions reductions are real and not just on paper. Uh, under the proposed reform, Australia will join Kazakhstan as the only two countries in the world that allow unfettered access to offsets. And there's <laughs> obviously no no good. There is a, a huge amount of evidence and agreement on the need for an emissions reduction hierarchy. Companies must first avoid and then reduce their own emissions. Offsets can only be used as a last resort. And to quote the former chief scientist, Professor Ian Chubb, offset, offsets can't be a device which big emitters use not to change their behaviour and not to do something about reducing emissions. I have no doubt that coalition senators will stand up and speak about how the safeguard mechanism will put industries at risk and, and push up prices. What they're missing is the opportunity for industry in a low carbon economy. What they're missing is the moral obligation to act on the biggest challenge humans have ever faced. We're blessed with an incredible wealth of resources in this country. We hear a lot about resources, and resources will be a big part of our future, but not fossil fuel resources. We need to focus on the resources of the future and stop allowing po politicians to conflate the two and present people who want a livable future, who want to transition away from fossil fuels, as someone who is against resources. Our major trading partners are decarbonising and starting to give preferential treatment to low carbon imports. That is a massive opportunity for Australia with our incredible mineral, mineral wealth. From the government, uh, we'll like, likely hear that finally something is being done and put in place for real climate policy, um, but we don't have time for incremental changes. Uh, we can't just say we're heading in the right direction. The fires and floods of the last few years should be a wake-up call 
for all of us. We owe it to those communities. We owe it to Australians. We owe it to Australians who haven't been born yet to deal with this now. And we have an opportunity with this legislation. We'll likely hear that a, that a hierarchy of mitigation is assumed in the legislation, but there is nothing explicit to ensure that we are avoiding emissions, we're reducing emissions, and then as a last resort, we're using the land sector to offset. So I commend this to the Senate. This is a really important policy, uh, but we have to get it right. And we have to, have to ensure that it reduces emissions in this country. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Dunningham. Deputy President, and I thank Senator Pocock for the opportunity to speak on uh, this matter of the, his urgency motion relating to the safeguard mechanism reform, which of course is a live issue in this parliament and something that uh, there's been much deliberation upon. I note in uh, the matter of urgency that Senator Pocock put before the chamber, he references um, global warming and keeping it to 1.5 degrees and of course goes on to talk about the design needing to be based on an emissions reduction hierarchy, which we've just heard him speak about, uh, that delivers genuine emissions reductions while also ensuring a future for essential industries. I think it's important to focus on a couple of points in that uh, as I provide um, a response from the coalition on this issue. Uh, the issue of climate change is, as this motion does actually point out, a global one. It's one where there is a global responsibility. So it is right for us to do what we can here in this country. I think it is imperative that a country that can, should, show responsibility and do what it can to minimise its impact on the environment, including when it comes to carbon emissions. But the problem with the matter we're dealing with when it comes to the safeguards mechanism uh, that uh, currently is something uh, that is a subject of consideration here. Um, w there is a difference of opinion in this place about exactly how best, under what is being proposed, we can achieve what it is we seek to achieve, minimising human impact on the environment and, in this case, minimising carbon emissions, without having an undue and damaging impact on the economy. It's something I've talked about a couple of times here. For what it's worth, in terms of the coalition, um, you know, our view is that uh, the proposal that has been put forward, uh, that is referenced in the motion, here in broad terms is one that we haven't properly seen assessed in terms of its impact both on an environmental level, what impact it will have on emissions reductions. We actually don't know. There are some projections. A lot of the modelling we know, as we've just dealt with a motion in this place uh, around some of the modelling the government refuses to reveal to us. We don't know what the impact is going to be, what reliance on carbon credits. Um, uh, similarly, we don't know uh, what impact such a proposition will have on the economy. It is something we've flagged as uh, something that needs more serious consideration and more thought put into it. The second part of Senator Pocock's uh, matter of urgency, um, talking about there, particularly at the tail end, um, when delivering genuine emissions reductions, ensuring there is a future for essential industries. And I think that is absolutely important. Part of the concern the coalition has around what is currently before us, of course, is the idea that uh, we will see industries that um, cannot meet emissions reductions mandated under this legislation and uh, matching regulation uh, cannot access carbon credits, uh, either through the safeguard mechanism credits or through ACUs, faced with this increased cost of doing business here. And the end result, despite promises that there will be a scheme to protect these businesses, these uh, trade-exposed industries, like cement manufacturing, for example, or aluminium uh, production, will be protected through a formula. Uh, we're not convinced that that is the case. The proposal doesn't ensure uh, a future for essential industries, and that is as important as making sure we get right what we need to when it comes to reducing emissions. Because if you don't get both of those things right, then we're failing on both counts uh, and no one is better off. And indeed, when you don't protect these trade-exposed industries and try and bring them on the journey with you, try and work with them to invest in innovation and technology, uh, to work with academic and educational institutions, to provide better uh, technology to minimise the impact on the environment, 
When you're not doing that, those businesses, because of the increased cost I talked about before, this $275 penalty per tonne of carbon above the baseline, uh, they will either reduce production here in the best case or simply shut up shop and go offshore. And those emissions will be generated that we could otherwise be working with them to minimise here, but be generated offshore somewhere else. And so back to that original point, it's a global responsibility, it's a global problem. And we can't simply offshore our problems and make someone else try and deal with them, because we will still have uh, the issues that Senator Pocock talked about before. That's why it is right to expect the information, to understand the government's proposal, and to ensure we're getting it right when it comes to uh, what it is we're putting in place to reduce emissions, but also to minimise the impact on the environment for our future generations. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. Senator McAllister. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, thank you, Senator Pocock, for bringing forward this afternoon's urgency debate. Action on safeguards is urgent, and this is something that we can both agree on. It is exactly why the government has legislation before the parliament right now that alters the safeguard mechanism so that facilities covered by the mechanism must reduce their direct emissions in the future. And we can also agree, I think, that Reforms to the safeguard mechanism must ensure that Australia's biggest emitters do their fair share when it comes to emissions reduction. It's on that basis that we're happy to support the motion, have this conversation here in the Senate, but we think it is important to be clear about the safeguard mechanism reforms that we propose and what we are doing, because we don't agree with the whole of the senator's contention in the motion. Now, our government is unapologetically focused on transforming Australia's domestic economy to a low-carbon economy. It is the most important thing we can do to support the ambitious international action that is necessary to contain global warming to one and a half degrees. It's why one of our first acts in government was to legislate an ambitious but achievable emissions reduction target of 43 per cent by 2030, a floor, not a ceiling. And our safeguard reforms have been carefully designed to support that and to support Australia's biggest emitters to remain competitive in a decarbonising global economy whilst reducing their emissions. A fit-for-purpose safeguard mechanism does provide the policy certainty for business to invest in decarbonisation and seize the opportunities from global energy transformation. Now, the mechanism we propose will progressively lower baselines consistent with our legislated target. We estimate it will deliver 205 million tonnes of abatement to 2030. And with respect to Senator Pocock, this is not trivial and this is not, as is characterised, incremental. These reforms are significant and they are designed so that all facilities, whether they are existing or whether they are new, reduce their emissions. And the proposal creates strong incentives for facilities to reduce those emissions on site and for the industrial sector to decarbonise. Of course, for facilities who may reduce emissions below their baseline, they will have the opportunity to create and sell safeguard mechanism credits. Uh, it is part of arrangements for flexibility that secure both our economic capacity and emissions reduction. We want to ensure that these facilities meet their obligations, but also that they can grow. We know that many safeguard facilities are in hard to abate sectors, like cement and steel, where technologies have not yet been demonstrated or aren't yet commercially available. And the access to flexible options is incredibly important for these sectors. ACUs are part of this. The land sector is part of this. And an ACU represents a tonne of emissions avoided or sequestered. We are strengthening confidence in that scheme to ensure the continued integrity of that abatement. We've done that through the Chubb recommendations, which found that the scheme is sound. Of course, Professor Chubb made recommendations for reform and we're committed to implementing those. But let's be real about this. These ACUs contribute to our legislated, legislated targets and they are not a free pass. Facilities that choose to use ACUs will have to buy them on the open market and many businesses will choose to permanently reduce emissions on the, in their own facilities on site. Now, of course, as indicated just now and in recent weeks, those opposite have made themselves irrelevant to this process by opposing a policy that they themselves proposed to implement when they were last in government. The former government, of course, had grand plans for safeguard crediting. In fact, it was their policy right up to election day. 
included in their election document our plan for resources. And yet here we are, coalition senators repeating the same old lines. After a decade of delay, of denial, of dysfunction, all that there is on offer is half-baked scare campaigns that are made up from the same old talking points. But for the first time in a decade, we have a parliament comprised of members and senators who are willing to deliver what the Australian people have been crying out for for a decade—action on climate. They called for action loudly at the election, and now they have a government that is willing to deliver. But we cannot do this on our own. We require a majority in this place, and when the legislation comes before senators, it will be a choice of real significance. We can seize or squander the only chance before us to get emissions down from our largest industrial emitters. I thank senators for their constructive engagement with Minister Bowen and with the government, and I look forward to the debate proper when it commences in this place. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. To have any chance of getting the climate crisis under control and meeting even this government's weak emissions target, there can be no new coal and gas projects, not one. The inquiry into Labor's safeguard mechanism heard from expert scientists and economists. The conclusion was clear. Under the safeguard mechanism, as it is currently proposed, actual pollution from coal and gas goes up. We're not talking about incremental progress that the Greens just don't think goes far enough. We are talking about a flawed scheme that will actually make the climate crisis worse. Surely the measure of a good climate policy is whether it makes pollution go down. On that measure alone, the safeguard mechanism fails to deliver. Throughout the inquiry, the government was asked repeatedly to show evidence that the safeguard mechanism would bring down pollution from coal and gas. They made no such commitment. The department offered no evidence. Their own projections confirm that emissions from gas will increase. The emissions from the first five years of the Scarborough gas project alone will wipe out the entire claimed benefit of the safeguard mechanism. It is difficult to have any confidence that the scheme will do anything to curb business as usual behaviour from coal and gas companies. It is no wonder that it has the support of Woodside, of Shell, of Rio Tinto, of Origin. The safeguard mechanism only targets scope one emissions and only 4.9% of coal and gas entities covered by the scheme will face a price signal. Any cost impacts imposed on this fraction of a fraction of overall emissions can be completely offset, with facilities able to buy their way out of the scheme at a very low price for a very, low very long time. Already contracted ACUs, or Australian Carbon Credit Units, account for nearly 70 per cent of the total abatement goal. So not only can coal and gas continue, uh, pollution continue to rise as long as enough offsets are bought, but more than two-thirds of the modest ambitions of this scheme will have been achieved without a single dollar of new investment. Lax exit arrangement for government contracts will see 84 million land-based offsets from the Mr Angus Taylor era flooding the private market to be scooped up by coal and gas companies planning new projects. This could push out exposed industries that actually need assistance to abate their emissions. The Greens want genuine Australian industry and manufacturing to thrive. Aluminium, steel, bricks, fertilisers, glass and cement all have a future in the clean economy, but coal and gas don't. We should be supporting genuine Australian industry to transition, not asking them to make room in a finite carbon budget for more coal and gas. We must limit the use of offsets and ensure that offsets have integrity. The scheme allows entities to keep going on as long as they buy enough dodgy offsets. It's a clever accounting trick, but it won't fool the planet. The Greens have made an offer to support the safeguard bill if the government commits to no new coal and gas. But we've also said that we're open to other ways of achieving that end, including through a climate trigger. This nation has squandered the last critical decade for climate action under a climate-denying government. We need this government to design a scheme that makes pollution from coal and gas go down, not up. Thank you, Senator Waters. 
Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. The government will be supporting this urgency motion today. However, we do not support all of the substance of Senator Pocock's motion. Let me be clear. The Albanese government does agree that action on safeguards is urgent. We agree with Senator Pocock on that point. That urgency is exactly why the government has legislation before the parliament right now that will alter the safeguard mechanism to ensure Australia's biggest emitters do their fair share when it comes to emissions reduction. And I was with the Energy Minister, Chris Bowen, in Gladstone at the start of the year uh, when he announced this policy and set out the details of the consultation process that we will go through. We have a proposed a fit-for-purpose safeguard mechanism that will provide policy certainty for businesses and the regional communities they support and will deliver genuine emissions reductions. The safeguards legislation will be a test for senators in this place. For the first time in a decade, we have a parliament of senators and members willing to deliver what the Australian people have been crying out for, real action on climate. At the last elections, Australia has voted for an end to the division on climate wars that have plagued government policy for a decade. And now they have an Albanese government that is ready to deliver and wants to deliver. We're getting on with the job and taking action on climate, just as Australians expect us to do. But we cannot do that on our own. We require majority support in this Senate. So I say to Senator Pocock and other senators, what will you do when the safeguard legislation comes before the Senate? Because there is going to be a clear choice that will need to be made. Senator Pocock can join with the government and take decisive action to get emissions down, to take 205 million tonnes of emissions out of the system to 2030, the equivalent of taking two-thirds of Australian cars off the road. Or it can choose to join the obstructors. And let's be clear, they have been obstructing action on climate change in this chamber for decades, both in government and in opposition. That is their record. He can sit alongside the climate wreckers and climate deniers on the opposition benches and block action on climate. That is the choice that senators will be facing. We know what happened when the Greens faced that same choice in 2009 and 2010. Instead of voting for the carbon pollution reduction scheme, they sat with the Liberals and Nationals of Tony Abbott and blocked climate action. Their choice derailed climate action for a decade is the reality. So I say to Senator Pocock and other senators, thinking of standing in the way of safeguards, do not let history repeat. There are good faith discussions happening between the government, the Greens and other senators, including Senator Pocock. I thank these senators for their engagement, which stands in stark contrast to those opposite, who, under the Leader of the Opposition, are determined to oppose everything and take no responsibility for cleaning up the mess that they created. The Albanese government will work we will continue to work constructively with those who are willing to be constructive and important partners uh, on this task as we look to reduce emissions. But this is an opportunity too important and too urgent to miss. That is why we agree that this is a matter of urgency today, and we will be acting on this issue as a matter of urgency in coming weeks. But if Senator Pocock really believes this is a matter of urgency, and wants to keep faith with the people of the Australian Capital, Capital Territory, who have been national leaders when it comes to climate action, then he will back our legislation when it comes to the Senate later this month. As I mentioned, I was with Minister Bowen in Gladstone when he announced our proposals around the safeguard mechanism. And the important point about that is that we want to work with industry to ensure that they can lower their emissions, because a lot of these industries are very important to our national supply chains, but also the task that we face in rebuilding manufacturing in this country as well. So, Unlike the Greens, who operate in a silo on these issues, uh, we know how important it is to work constructively with industry uh, who want to bring down their emissions, and we want to provide the government leadership to enable that that can happen. And that's what we want to do through the safeguard mechanisms. Uh, that's what Minister Bowen announced when we were in Gladstone uh, in January. And that's what the government intends on delivering on uh, over the coming weeks in this chamber. So I'd call on all senators uh, to engage in constructive discussion uh, to ensure that we can pass this safeguard mechanism, because it is of vital importance for Australia's future, but it is also of vital importance for Australia's industries um, that they can continue to uh, operate uh, and also deliver the employment that so many regional families rely on. That's what we want to deliver.
Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Senator Steele John. The northern Jarrah forests of my home state of Western Australia are some of the most beautiful, diverse, and vulnerable forests on planet Earth. The preservation of these forests and uh, their continued contribution uh, to action on climate change is paramount. And they have indeed been identified as an ecosystem of particular risk uh, due to the increasingly drying climate, which is a reality of climate change. It is places like this that I want to see protected. It is places like this and the contribution that they make to our planet and our community which should call on us, among so many other things, to pass climate laws which take on corporations and actually tackle the climate crisis. Corporations, for instance, such as Alcoa, have gotten away with far too much for far too long. Not only have they been clearing our forests, just last month it was revealed that they have built a pipeline carrying toxic waste across Western Australia right over the top of a key water supply dam. Toxic waste flying over the top of a drinking water reserve. This toxic waste contains uh, forever chemicals known to cause serious adverse health issues, including cancer and impacts on reproductive health. Now, this wasn't sort of unforeseen accident. This wasn't an unfortunate whoopsie. Alcoa made an application to build this pipeline. The application was under assessment, and Alcoa went ahead and built the thing anyway. Now, you'd rightfully assume that such willful disregard for human health and the law would result in harsh penalties. Significant fines, criminal charges strike me as appropriate. So what happened? Well, Alcoa was forced to purge the pipeline and no, nothing. That's it. That's all. That's all they were required to do. This is, again, uh, not something that went unforeseen. Alcoa knew that this was exactly how it would play out, just as Rio Tinto knew. Uh, when they misplaced a radioactive capsule somewhere in the Pilbara, and the worst they faced was a $1,000 fine. EWA mining companies know that it is better for business to ask forgiveness rather than permission. These corporations must be held to account uh, via climate laws for their impact Thank you. on the Thank climate you, Senator crisis. Senator Steele John. Uh, Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Deputy President. Um, it was good to hear Labor senators today acknowledge that millions of Australians, after a, more than a decade of climate inaction in this place, voted to get climate action in this parliament. And isn't it ironic that the first piece of legislation we have before us in this parliament is an ex-Tony Abbott piece of legislation? Now, soon we are going to debate whether you can polish a turd, but let me tell you right here and now, the only thing this legislation will safeguard is the profits of big polluting companies. The only thing this legislation will safeguard is the cosy relationship between the Labor political party and the Liberal political party and their big fossil fuel donors. It won't safeguard the children who are here in the chamber today watching this debate and their futures. It won't safeguard our climate or our environment or our communities that are suffering and have been in parliament this week urging us not to pass this safeguard mechanism as it is. You can't fix a problem by making it worse. We are not going to let this opportunity pass. The 1.8 million Australians who voted for the Greens to give us the balance of power in this place to make sure we get climate action in this parliament because it has been too long. Some of us have been in this chamber day in, day out now for over a decade trying to get climate action. And I thank Senator Pocock for bringing this debate here today. 
we will not be locking in failure, Senator Ayres. I'm happy to take your objection. I, I, I don't know why you keep writing Julie Gillard out of the history books, because she was able to come in here and with the Greens negotiate what was the gold standard around the world for climate action. We were very proud of that. I'm not sure why you and the Labor political party keep writing her out of the history books. Going back to Order. 2009. Well, the world's changed since 2009. In case you haven't noticed, the physical world is changing. The Barrier Reef is bleaching. You can laugh at the Barrier Reef bleaching, which you Order. always do, Senator Canavan. And I hope the cameras Order. once again come in close on your Everyone's smiling face so nice. while we're talking about the death of our natural world, Order. our forest burning, the loss of biodiversity, Order. the shifts we're seeing in Order. nature. You might think that's funny, but we're in here to get climate action. That's what Australians put us in for in this place for, and we will not let them down. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. So the question before the chair. Well there are eight seconds left. If anyone wants to take the final eight seconds. No? Well the question before the chair therefore is the motion moved by Senator Pocock. Uh, those sorry, Senator David Pocock, those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the no's have it. I think the ayes have it. I think the ayes have it. No's have it. No's have it. Okay. Division required. Division required? Yes. Ring the bells, four minutes.
lock the doors. So the question is that the urgency motion standing in the name of Senator Pocock's standing in the name of Senator Pocock be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Pratt as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes. Order, there being 32 ayes and 27 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative.